Well, good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to the 12th in the coffee series sponsored by the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership at Seton Hall University. I'm Reggie Lewis, the center's executive director, and it's great to greet you from our campus here in South Orange, New Jersey. The coffee series provides an opportunity to showcase the inspirational stories of servant leaders and the endless ways in which individuals, organizations, and society in general can be transformed by the power of servant leadership, a philosophy in which the leader first seeks to serve. And I assure you that our guests for this session will not disappoint. Our program today is designed to not only deepen our understanding of servant leadership, but to foster an appreciation for ways in which we all can shape lives of hope, healing, resilience, despite the constant state of turbulence we now find ourselves in. This is why the Greenleaf Center has spent the last 50 plus years promoting the awareness, understanding, and practice of servant leadership. In addition to our webinar series, the center's signature programs include supporting research on servant leadership, online learning opportunities for professionals seeking to apply servant leadership in the workplace. We also partner with the university's Upward Bound program to expose high school students to the notion of first seeking to serve. And last fall, we unveiled an annual lecture that brings together thought leaders and issue experts to address significant societal challenges confronting our nation today. This afternoon's webinar was made possible by the generous support of the Alverno College Alumni Association. Thank you so much, ladies. And now allow me to do a proper introduction of our distinguished guest. Ms. Jovita Carranza is the former administrator of the US Small Business Administration. As administrator, she led a nationwide team of professionals dedicated to ensuring America's entrepreneurs have the support and resources needed to start, grow, and expand their small businesses. Prior to leading the SBA, Ms. Carranza served as the 44th treasurer of the US Department of the Treasury appointed by President Donald Trump. As a principal advisor to Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, Ms. Carranza focused on increasing participation in our vibrant economy by fostering financial capability and sustainability. She previously served as the deputy administrator for the SBA under President George W. Bush where she received a bipartisan, unanimous confirmation by the US Senate. And prior to her first SBA appointment, Ms. Carranza had a distinguished 30 year career at United Parcel Service, better known as UPS, where she was the highest ranking Latina in the company's history. She started as a part-time night shift box handler and worked her way up to become a vice president overseeing Latin America and Caribbean operations. A Chicago native, Ms. Carranza earned her MBA from the University of Miami and received executive governance, management, and financial training at NCAAB Business School in Paris, France, Michigan State University, and the University of Chicago. So you're all obviously in for a treat, and of course you'll hear from Jovita momentarily, but it's now my pleasure to present the moderator for today's program. Dr. Mary J. Meehan is a member of the Center's Board of Trustees and President Emerita of Seton Hall University. In addition to serving as Seton Hall's interim president, she also served in the capacity of Executive Vice President for Administration. Prior to her work at the university, Mary was president and honorary alumna of Alverno College. She has an extensive professional healthcare background, having previously served as executive vice president and chief operating officer at St. Mary's Hospital, New Jersey, and as administrator and CEO of St. Vincent's Hospital in Harrison, New York. Mary earned her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees from Seton Hall University, and also earned a graduate degree in health policy and management from New York Medical College. Jovita and Mary, let's make it official. Welcome to the coffee series. And I hope you have mugs on your end. 
I'm now going to turn it over to Mary. Well, thank you so much, Reggie, and, and truly what a delight it is uh, to be with all of you today, and, and particularly you, Javita, who I've now known for most 20 years. So it really is a special treat for me to spend a little bit of time with you today, and perhaps even after all these years, learn some new things about you. So if we could start, I'd just like to ask you, you know, we just all learned that you were born in Chicago. Could you tell us a little bit about what were some of your fondest memories of, of growing up in Illinois? Yes, and Dr. Meehan, I'd like to first start out by thanking you for hosting this particular event. I know uh, in visiting with Alverno student body and being on a couple of Zoom calls with them, with uh, some of the trustees, I thank them publicly for sponsoring this particular uh, event. And I also want to thank the Greenleaf Center um, collective body of leaders that have made um, this program possible. So um, again, I'm I consider myself privileged and honored to be part of this program. So thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question about Chicago, when people ask me or mention that I'm from Illinois, I, I definitely, um, emphasize the fact that I'm from Chicago because it's one of the same. When you have 12 million people in Illinois and 8 million of them are in Chicago, I obviously am very proud uh, of being a Chicagoan and being a Midwestern as well. Uh, you know, the influence of Chicago and its dynamic industry and multi-sector uh, really instilled in me a fast-paced, very diligent work ethic uh, because everyone in Chicago either prepared for the winter, prepared for the fall or the summer. And it was one of a adap adaptation as well as um, an anxiousness to really get over one season to prepare for the next. And each season offered an opportunity to do something, something unique. Uh, in the snow, I helped my parents dig out of snow, their, their vehicle. And uh, so that brought the family together. It really unified the family during the winter months. It's a, um, Chicago is known, especially the state, is known for its uh, family values. And, uh, and it's really kind of grit and ethnic diversity. So I was part of that melting pot. And I just uh, often brag about Chicago. I'm always, I always have this sense of pride because when I mention to people, whether it's in Washington DC, San Antonio, wherever, that I come from Chicago, they always mention, what a beautiful city. Oh, I love, I just love Chicago. And so I hope I'm uh, you know, kind of exuding some enthusiasm about where I was born and raised. And my mother and father were actually born in Chicago as well. Well, I learn something new every day. Yes. <laughs> well, well, having lived in the Midwest 12 years myself, I know what a wonderful, what it, how wonderful it is to be out there. The whole, oh, whole yes. country is beautiful, but there is something special. Maybe you could, we'd I think we'd all love to hear some about some of who were the leaders who really, if you will, you looked up to during your formative years. You know, when I read that question and, and realized that formative is a fully loaded term and that even in my current young age, I'm still <laughs> learning, I believe that every hour of every day and every day of every month is formative for me because I kind of started out at a late age learning English. Um, the fact that I was um, about six or seven when I really became um, uh, engaged speaking very confidently in English when I was young, but prior to that, it was all Spanish. So I always looked up to leaders, whether it was the doctor, whether it was the teacher, the military serviceman, um, or someone of authority because what I recognize in them is that they brought value in, in what they were performing or a, a particular service. Um, beyond the kind of the early stages of my um, impressive years, the, the other, from a business perspective, the other formidable leaders that I really looked up to were individuals like Jack Welch. Now, I don't know if it's because I'm a Midwestern that I looked at uh, an individual like Jack Welsh, who was very innovative uh, at General Electric and always um, had some very strict disciplines of following up, et cetera, et cetera. So I learned just by listening about his accomplishments at GE, 
on how he innovate, brought innovation to that particular organization. The other is, I know I go, I go from one, one extreme to another with so, someone like Steve Covey uh, because of this um, seven kind of particular habits that success, so successful leaders had. And I wanted to learn what they were and if I even possess any of them uh, in order to um, either strengthen them, amplify them, or for that matter, learn them. So I, I really followed Steve Covey for, for, um, for several years while I was at UPS, to tell you the truth. Um, and there's a, many others like Lou Holtz, just do the right thing, right? I was athletic, I played softball, I actually did, uh, played some um, volleyball, et cetera. So coaches were really impressed. I was impressed with coaches, especially Vince Lombardi. And I'll tell you two reasons. One, he always says, winners never quit and quitters never win. So I always felt bad if I, if I even thought of quitting. Uh, secondly, it was his uh, rule of arriving to a meeting 15 minutes early to consider on time. And I lived that for 30 years at UPS. So you can imagine how pleased I was that I didn't have to learn something new. I was already following Vince Labardi for many, many years. So those are just an example of a few leaders that I admire. Well, thank you. Um, and clearly, you know, when you talk about coaches, it always reminds me of coaches in some ways are really are embody servant leadership, at least in terms of yes. their goal is to bring out the best in others. And certainly that's what coaches do. Yes, uh, especially when they would take the most, the, the least competent employ, uh, excuse me, um, uh, athlete, or the, or the one that wasn't highly regarded. And he would just develop them, you know, the coaches mm -hmm. develop them to superstars. And I just think that uh, takes such an such ability and, and passion and commitment to the humankind. So yes. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you think about when you were in school, and uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about Alverno in a second, but when you were in school, what, what were you thinking? What did you see yourself doing in the future then? Was it always, did you see yourself more in the business world or just? Well, actually, when I went to school, I had this vision of being more socially oriented. In other words, being in the liberal arts, uh, being an educator or um, perhaps in the legal arena where I'd be an attorney and really have some tough cases. And I obviously make some headway in some particular uh, policy or issue or, or case. But it then later evolved into a means to an end uh, because there were so many needs at home. I thought the only way that I can continue contributing value, both home, um, uh, community, and then eventually in the private sector as an employee, employee to our employer, I, um, I then realized that acquiring higher education uh, also very strategic training would benefit the whole, not just myself. And so uh, I, I perceived education as a way of attaining growth and really developing worth. Now, some people think of wealth creation. I thought at that time, when I, while young, was worth creation. Uh, I needed validation. And so I felt that the campus life and really engaging with smart people would enable or facilitate that. So I, I was a very serious student. I didn't go in and party, unfortunately. I went in <laughs> and uh, you know stuck to the books because I had so much catching up to do and then valued everyone that would uh, and facilitate some learning skills, right, for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I would embark what I would know. I was bilingual. I uh, was uh, a little bit older in age when I was pursuing my college degree. So uh, I thought it was a win-win proposition uh, while attending school. Well, you know, you've had a long association with Alverno and I, I know still currently serve on their board and they're so grateful I know to have you there. And cl clearly the years I spent there were very important years in my life, some of the happiest. Um, when I think back to Sister Joelle, or the long-term president, she had a personal relationship with Robert Greenleaf, as you may know. And, and actually Alverno was the first and I think only college to give Robert Greenleaf an honorary degree because she saw in him the wisdom of what he did. So during your time there, did, did you begin to understand was there a sort of a formal introduction to servant leadership? I think you already understood that and embodied it, but did Alverno have any role in that? 
for you? Yes, and Dr. Meehan, the, what I sense when I arrived at Alverno is that every contact I had was an individual who wanted to help succeed, whether it was successfully complete an application, successfully set up a schedule to, to meet um, educators or counselors. So the entire introduction, the simulation to Alverno, although it was short lived for me, was one of servitude. It, it wasn't just because Alverno had um, a touch point of, of religious background, of a faith background, but more about wanting everyone that entered their, that particular institution to succeed. And what did they have to do or say um, to facilitate that? Um, so it was a warm feeling. And then later on, I learned what the philosophy was and the abilities. And so I fully understood why um, all of the facility and the leaders at Alverno um, kind of walked the same walk and mm -hmm. talked the walk, right? And um, so. It was a great, it was a unique experience at Alverno, Mary, because it was a women's college. So the students were primarily women, the educators were primarily women, and that afforded me a real contrast at that time to what I was experiencing at UPS, mm -hmm. which was predominantly male, very disciplined, very regimented, and Alverno opened the spirit, right? It mm -hmm. opened the mind. And so to me, it was a very uh, unique experience at Alverno. Yeah, I have some fond memories too. I, can I share one? Sure. <laughs> um, you know, there were some imperatives that I had to really um, grasp as it relates to uh, business concepts. And coming to Alverno, the objective I had was to improve on my communication skills as well as others so that I could be very effective um, and have very favorable outcomes for our company in team building. So when I signed up for a class, which was taught by a Miss Barbara Nevers, yeah. I was very <laughs> enlightened. I was not prepared for uh, this particular, um, very determined, uh, great tenacity in teaching their students, and she was a perfectionist. And that's the kind of training I needed. I had it at a UPS, but coming from a woman and in her environment, and she took so much pride in her classroom mm -hmm. and the product and the performance of her students, I quickly kind of, you know, uh, took note of it. And there was no slack time in her class. As a matter of fact, and I think your audience would appreciate this because I hope they learn that you cannot correct too often and too much because when I would submit my documentation to her or my write-up, I had more red, red ink on the margins than I did the, <laughs> the length of my, my, my uh, composition. But she impacted me so much that later on in years, um, actually in 2004, because I was in Alverno uh, early two, 2000, I invited her to attend an event in New York. It was a Latin American, um, it, was a, it was recognizing Latinas, uh, professionals. And the Hispanic business magazine had a, a grand, it was a gala uh, for the recipient and I was actually the one who received the businesswoman of the year. And the, the um, expression that Ms. Nevers had was very uh, interesting because she had never been in a room with hundreds of professional Hispanics at once. So she and I had a real kind of, um, should I say a, a very transformative moment for her to be among so many professional Hispanics was a new learning for her. And for me, I owed that experience to her because of how she helped me with my communication skills. And so it was a win-win uh, exchange to the point where today I affectionately name her G.I. Nevers because we <laughs> have, 
I affectionately, okay, called her GI Nevers, and I told her uh, I did, and I explained why. So you, you just never know how an institution can impact a professional uh, such as myself. And, and I'll just add that I was at Alverno at that time, and I remember her coming back and how proud she was of you and, and what a meaningful experience it was in her life. So thank you for doing yes. that for her. You're welcome. Um, just moving forward, could you just talk a little bit about your family and how that influenced your career and your educational considerations? Yes, my, my parents were, as I mentioned earlier, born in Chicago, but they were raised in Mexico. So their family really ingrained on them uh, some really impeccable work ethics to the point where when they transitioned back to, to Chicago, to the Midwest, uh, they were in their mid-teens when, when both my mother and father, they weren't married obviously, but different families, they transitioned back to Chicago and eventually became married. But they brought back with them not only the very staunch disciplined work ethics, but also the value and the importance of the family and the family unit as a source of uh, strength and, and support. You know, my parents, um, like many, especially my mother, urged her daughters, I have three siblings, to really work towards a better uh, life through education, uh, a quality job, and trustworthiness. Uh, that were, th those were principles that my parents always instilled on us. Mm -hmm. So the influence one, one was of integrity and work ethic, and uh, also the importance of family and faith. The, the fact that I observed my father uh, really take pride whenever his particular manager or business owner applauded his work, his performance, and how he spoke at the kitchen table about how he was recognized and why he was recognized and what that meant instilled in us that work was important, being recognized for good work was, was important for the, for the company, and it, you become valued. You know, my uh, parents were also individuals that never complained about work, um, nor work hours. They actually sought more work for overtime. And back then it was very important to have overtime, to be able to live the American dream, right? To purchase a home, a car. And so I knew that I learned the value of money for the essentials, for the fundamentals. Uh, and so those were my initial you know, lessons that I learned, which were very conservative and uh, frugal. Now I know that we're very frugal. Uh, at that time, I thought, well, I guess everybody else lives this way, right? Uh, very conscientious <laughs> about their funds and about reporting to work on time, being very reliable employees, etc. And so um, that's, those are the traits I really just, I would say, expanded on as years followed. I think often it's our early childhood that really helps more than anything else form who we are as human beings. And it seems clear, you know, that, that that's your experience too. So, oh, yes. My mom, my mom was a, ha a taskmaster. She, she didn't allow us to have B's and A's. She wasn't talking about going to college or because she thought, you know, Latinas, we're going to get married, have a good marriage, and they're going to provide, right? But, but she <laughs> definitely pursued those B's and those A's. Uh, and so I, I really am appreciative of that all okay. these years. Let's shift a little bit to UPS. You spent a number of years there and interesting, you know, what a what a trajectory your career had. So you had so many years there. Can you talk a little bit about that journey, if you would? Sure. When, when I was asked that question, oh, just uh, a few months ago, I never do tally things, not personal things. Everything else, yes, right? Metrics and, and, and spreadsheets and things as such. But I sat still for a moment and said, well, what, what was the UPS journey besides working hard and progressing? And, and then you take inventory of how many milestones were achieved. And one of the significant milestones that is, is very, very crucial for young people to know, and I know you have some people who have 
signed up, Mary, to, uh, for this program. You know, I had six promotions, none of which I really asked for, just worked very hard towards, and eight relocations. And the eight relocations required, you saved money to make a down payment, and then you dealt with um, uh, in purchasing a home, and then uh, about three, four years later, maybe two or three years later, you would sell that home. But just realize the dynamics and the transitions that you have to go, the people that you meet, the uh, investments that you make, and all the financial transactions that are required, while at the same time learning a new staff, learning a new operation, the community, and everything that comes with it. Um, fortunately, UPS had a lot of standardization, but six promotions and eight relocations, uh, I look back and I was like, wow, that is truly the art of adaptability. And servant mm -hmm. leaders um, require that particular trait because now with the diversity, the dem uh, demographics and the current political landscape, adaptability is very key in, in today's mm -hmm. um, environment. You know, my supervisory roles and executive roles um, included managing and working with uh, all mo modes of transportation and all different uh, levels of skill sets. And so one of the um, areas that I don't talk much about uh, is that the, the nation's most uh, prominent union locals represented the majority of the UPS employees. And these unions represented employees that did, uh, that manage or drove or handle equipment like trucks, tractor trailers, gateways, uh, air ramp operations, air cargo transportation. So it was very diverse. And as you know, uh, Mary, that uh, Teamsters are some tough guys. <laughs> They're tough negotiators, especially when you discipline an employee. So in every case, I had to be alert, aware, and informed because I realized very early on as a supervisor that the company would suffer significant consequences if not if labor relations were strained. And our customers would obviously um, would have to be compromised in the process of you know, mediocre service being provided to them. But as you know, over time, I excelled to become the first Latina in the company's history, as Reginald stated. And being the first Latina, like a trailblazer, they call me the veteran, they call me the warrior. I had all kinds of unique titles, but I wore them with pride because um, I also realized that being the first in anything, Mary, I was setting precedence and I was becoming a role model. And that was added responsibility besides doing what was good for my family, good, good for my brand. But now there would be consequences if someone was trying to emulate me and I was not acting out accordingly as a servant leader. So um, with leadership comes a lot of responsibility. And, uh, but I enjoyed every, every moment of it. Well, I think that's so true, isn't it? That people often who are not in, in these executive roles don't know, often always appreciate that it's a tremendous burden, especially from the perspective you stated, you know, to be a role model and to say, this is what I hope I can inspire others to be. But at the same time, I have to live up to that. It's, it can be a really complex dynamic, but you've done it and you've done it well. If we can, so... I want to shift for a second because it's a topic we talk about it now. Inflation, but is one topic. But then we talk about supply chain challenges, and and so I don't know any conversation I've been at at any cocktail party where that's not a topic. So I'm interested. We all are in your perspective. How did we get here, and what's the way out of this? Um, are we going to just have to keep enduring the pain, or do you, what do you think? Well, Mary, you I have a very close appreciation and a unique appreciation for obviously the supply chain because I worked in it for 30 years in Latin America, coordinate in Latin America, Central America, um, and the air operation Louisville, Kentucky uh, required some very um, tight synchronization, 
uh, coordination of um, particular business units. It has about a th more than a thousand touch points, very complicated system. And so any disruption, any disconnect on the links, then obviously the end user is going to be compromised in a big way. But to answer your question about the current supply chain, as part of the administrator role at SBA, I, I was um, interested in meeting with directors of ports, some of the biggest ones uh, in the United States. And when meeting with them, they indicated that there, they sensed a new business model, which was typically manufacturers and retailers were ordering just in time. But since the pandemic hit us and there was a complete shutdown, people, excuse me, manufacturers and retailers then began to order for the just in case scenario because of the crisis. So when you have a just, just in time transitioning to a just in case and they're doubling on their inventory and you have the consumer who is now hoarding you compound the current situation. So step back a bit, you're compiling the issues, compounding the issues about supply and demand, but now you have an infrastructure such as drivers, loaders, their equipment that requires some time to ramp up. We were already short of drivers prior to the pandemic. And so now you're faced with double the volume that you have to uh, pick up or drop off. And we didn't have enough drivers. So, um, and when I say we nationally, and it takes about two minimum, two to six months to certify a particular skill level in the supply chain system. You got way bills for the international, you, got, you have remittances, you have drivers, you have loaders, you, you name it, you have welders, you have mechanics for these, for these uh, truck drivers. So it was um, a, real, a real issue for all of the components, all the leaders in the supply chain system. The fact that uh, it takes two to six months to certify proficiency, and then we're already faced with uh, a shortfall. What we need to do now is really look at ways to identify potential solutions to long-term crisis planning. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, people wanna know how, how much longer are we going to be faced with this bottleneck? And we've gone from ha having a shortage of um, circuit breakers for vehicles to baby formula, mm -hmm. which is, you know, now you prioritize which auto parts, which mechanical parts, which, you know, circuit breakers, what, where, who, who receives that product first? And then now we've learned that um, there's also a food supply that's shortage and it's held up in containers. So um, it's a matter of, we're in this mess now, so it's a matter of short-term solutions while planning for long-term right? Plan of crisis planning. Sometimes I think we all have a hard time with the long term. We're much more yeah, interested yeah, in getting yeah. the short term. Yeah, someone, but, uh, I know people have said, oh, but do you think by two, by 2023 is, um, and I'm, I'm not a um, optimistic um, supply chain because of, because I understand the nuances, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's going to require a couple of years, really, to ramp up the, the employee skill level to identify them. Because as you know, there's still the COVID scare. Right. So that hasn't gone away completely. Right. And so right. uh, I wish I could give you, uh, I, I wish I could be a bearer of good news. Maybe some port director has something different to share with you, but based on the links, it seems that there's going to be a, a couple yeah, of years of our belt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, continuing on a challenging path for a second. Yeah. Um, and so as administrator of the Small Business Administration, you were truly among one of the key leaders implementing the Paycheck um, Protection Plan. 
during this pandemic. And the program was hugely important, uh, as you well know better than I, to the survival of so many small businesses. So looking back, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, and what accomplishment are you most proud of? That's a fully loaded question, just like the <laughs> supply chain. However, well, this prepared, one's tougher, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm prepared in, in this way, Mary, because I know you have a lot of phenomenal leaders on this on this webinar. And you all know that leaders, when met with a crisis, the responsibility we have is to act quickly, uh, think smartly, and mitigate losses to your organization. So those were the pressing issues. And that is, here's the, here's the problem. Uh, not so much what are we going to do about it. It's a matter of here, here's the problem. How big is it? And then how do we mitigate the losses? And the losses we were realizing at that time, as you know, and your audience knows, it was 30 million small businesses with about 60 million um, employees collectively. And we were required in a very short window to provide stimulus uh, funds to as many businesses that could apply. I knew that if all 30 million businesses apply for a loan to protect 60 million employees, that many would stay off the unemployment lines that many lives would be protected and businesses would be sustained. Of course, we didn't, we realized that 30 million small businesses did not require the stimulus fund. Uh, about 8 million did, and about $800 billion worth of funds were processed through SBA and Treasury. Uh, we were responsible for not reviewing the loan or accepting the documentation. We accepted the loan and process uh, whether it was a legitimate loan in order to for the banks to then uh, allocate the funds. But the increased demand, the unprecedented situation, and stressing, stressing the shortage of employees, we knew uh, up front that it was going to really stress all of our systems at SBA. But our goal was don't let the system stop. Keep it churning. Whatever it is, just keep it running. And so I'm proud um, that the very intelligent employees, very, very committed employees that we had on board, um, and they're very, very uh, astute, uh, should I say, systems engineers, lawyers, um, policy individuals, it run, ran the whole gamut. And they all agreed, hands on deck, whether they were at home or in the office, Mary. And uh, we coordinated with not only Treasury, uh, but also OMB and the White House to pull this all off. And, um, and um, we were successful in enabling small businesses to be sustained and, and not have as many people out of, out of work. Mm -hmm. uh, what would I have done differently you know, in, in time of crisis, which is the most difficult time to lead, you have mm -hmm. to really delegate and rely on the, on the talent and the loyalty and the commitment and the stability of, of your team, which is really how we pulled it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 70% of all the loans went to um, employers that had less than 10 employees, which is a very important metric because uh, most women owned businesses have less than eight employees. So we were able to facilitate to sole proprietors, contractors, and then small business owners. Um, and being a woman in a minority, I really considered it a privilege and an honor to be able to provide that type of support um, to, to women businesses especially those in the underprivileged communities, which I'm so familiar with because I grew up in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I understand the struggle to have access to capital and really have significance. They don't have anybody to speak to. And um, so we were trying to open up all our communication channels to at least facilitate that for them. 
Well, you know, it, it's um, particularly when you look at it, the lens of how many of these smaller businesses are led by women it, it, and by women who often come from environments where they don't have the financial support system they need. It is an important thing, I think, for all of us as Americans to realize when we look back at this. Yes, we, we as leaders, you know, there's going to be an error factor, Mary, and there's always going to be a, a, a somewhat of a breach, but it's uh, your recovery of those situations that's mm -hmm. so important as a leader. And also not to, well, uh, should I put it this way, to kind of lift the weight of the major burden from the employees. So it's not a punitive act, but it's right. one of support. Absolutely. Well, I know our times, I'm going to go quickly only because I know our time's running yes. a little short, but can, can you, if you're comfortable with this, can you share any um, insights of times when you found yourself challenged to be a servant leader or challenged to serve others well? Can you think of some that might be relevant to this group? I'll make it very quick. The, the, I, I just stated that the, the most challenging uh, time for an effective servant leader is during a crisis. Mm. Right? Because all, all the focus is on how good are you and how are you going to pull this off and um, you know, in colloquial, it's like how many people are going to fall off the scale, right? As a result, as a result of the intensity by which we, we lead. Uh, I will share that the Y2K was an interesting experience for me because I was man, I was leading uh, Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean, but I was only on the job one month. And they told me I had to transform all the systems, all the shipping systems in about 40 countries and uh, from Miami. And I was like, I've only been here a month. I, I know what to do with truck drivers and loaders and things as such, but all of Latin America and, uh, and I'm bilingual. So that helped, right? I was able to give instruction in Spanish and in English and relied on my team. But that was a daunting experience to have thousands of systems not only transform, but then you learn midway that a lot of those systems did not have current licenses. And so for software and whatnot, I'm sure Microsoft would be pleased to hear this, we had to catch up and license all our uh, particular software and hardware on those international systems. And so that was a huge undertaking and um, being there a month, I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull it off, but we did. And we had 100% recovery while still maintaining the shipments. The, the other, and we just talked about it, was um, being the administrator of SBA during the pandemic. Because in that role, you know, confirmation process takes months and months and months. So by the time I arrived to SBA, which was in January, Two months later, the president announces that there's a pandemic. So I don't know if crisis follows me or I follow crisis maybe <laughs> because I'm only in the job for two months. But I stress that because that's when you pull up or force all that you've learned and, um, and, and amplify it in these particular difficult times. And then reliance on your subject matter experts and working really well with your rank and file. That's really critical. That's what, that's why I'm speaking to you here as a success because I had great rank and file and the communication was essential in pulling off these you know, massive um, uh, type of undertakings. You know, it's easy to have the SBA situation. It's easy to be a CEO of a company of 50 employees, 500 employees, 500,000 employees like UPS. But when all eyes are on you as a leader, because the stakes are really high, you have 60 million employees and 30 million small businesses. What do you do? Well, you really sharpen those skills of coordination, adaptability, and collaboration with people that that agency had never worked with before. Um, but again, what I learned at Alverno, at University of Miami, NCIAD, I brought it all together and uh, optimized every skill I had and uh, pushed 
I really pushed our employees to levels they never thought they could achieve. And that's servant leadership. Yes, um, as a matter of fact, the, the, during crisis, Mary, and very quickly, the, the, the employee's ability to follow the chain of command becomes very, very stressed. Unless, and all good leaders will do this, you clarify and communicate well the strategy and vision. Well, I think our 30 minutes is up and it's time to turn this over um, for some questions to the audience. So okay. I will, much as we had a few more questions and the sake of allowing others to speak, I think we'll, we'll now step aside and- Very good, thank you, let, absolutely. Let thank we you obviously, so sorry, Mary. Well, we obviously, Jovita, could go on for another hour or so listening to your just amazing conversation with Mary. So we do thank you for that. But we want to get in a few questions. And I'm going to ask uh, Nick from our team to take us through that process. Well, thank you, Reggie. Now we'll be moving on to some questions we've received from our audience. Audience members, feel free to keep them coming. Hello, Ms. Carranza, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's great. Perfect. Let's begin. Our first question here is, could you share any particularly memorable stories from your visits to small businesses during the pandemic? Oh, most definitely. I have so many. How much time do I have? I will, I will share a unique experience I had when, at a brewery, not, not because I was drinking beer, okay? I, I want to make that clear. But the brewery transitioned over to making sanitizing uh, products. And I thought that these women owned businesses that were able to, I don't like to use the term pivot, but for the sake of time, they pivoted so easily and so strategically and so effectively that I was more than impressed. And then I met with small businesses that were worth about $50 million. I mean, they weren't small like a million dollar business, but about 50 million. And I met individuals that were responsible for developing like um, the cases for the nuclear bombs, uh, or bombs, I should say, not nuclear, bombs for our, our military aircraft. And they were at risk. So um, the fact that they were offering their employees bonuses, um, sleeping on site, whatever they needed in order to bring their employees on, on payroll uh, was very impressive to me. So I learned so much intimate, intimate uh, processes um, of these business owners. And I, I can't wait to go back and visit with them to tell the truth. It was so rewarding. Thank you so much for that. Some very interesting experiences during a really strange and unique time in our lives, for sure. Yes. Our next, our next question is how did you navigate power structures in the workplace earlier in your career versus later in your career when you had a more formal leadership role? I did it from day one. When I was a part-time supervisor, I always had like two or three levels of management above me. And people would say, so where do you wanna go when you, um, in your next move? And I would say, I wanna be like, and it was, it was always two or three levels above. And they would ask, well, wait a minute, you, ha you have to go first to these other two levels before you reach that one. I said, no, I want to reach for perfection. And so I realized very early on that different levels of management provided certain skill sets. And so modeling the best skill sets, the best uh, skill sets, excuse me, um, actually provided the best value so coordinating the efforts and what was important for each one of those um, levels of management to me was not a pastime. It was actually an opportunity and a challenge. I, I love putting things together. I'm not an engineer, but definitely people, talent, and really um, maximizing each category's capacity is, is what I thrive on. And so I started at a very young age uh, acknowledging the levels of and the potential of each level and trying to bring them all together. I hope I answered your question. You did very well. Thank you for that insight. Okay. 
Okay, we have one more question here that we've just got. Thank you so much for this wonderful panel. Jovita, I appreciate very much how you speak about the teams you work with. I'm wondering if you could provide insights into how you identify excellence while hiring. Are there any characteristics you look for or questions you ask to identify strong servant leaders in interviews or when considering people for promotion? Yes, uh, that's an interesting question because when I was a uh, full-time supervisor at UPS, I was responsible for interviewing future loaders. Then later on, I interviewed engineers. And Mary Miha knows that I've even interviewed college presidents. And so that those levels of responsibility and skill level was um, a journey. It was a process. But servant leadership, you can almost detect early on when you ask questions such as, what is the highest level you want to attain? How are you going to go about it? Um, what is your support system and how do you terminate someone and when you, and you ask them when you employ someone. What do you, what traits do you look for. And I hold a conversation, I have always been an interviewer that kind of walked that fine line Mary because there were times where I would ask some questions where some of my personnel managers were asked did you really ask that you know that's not legal and I said I was just holding a conversation. But I, I wasn't like trying to position the person to fail. I really wanted the person to succeed in the interview and also the company to hire the best candidate available. Because the last thing you want to do is employ someone who's not going to have the capacity or the, even the interest of um, contributing in big ways to an organization. And it's at that point, it's not a win-win proposition. I want to uh, avoid any consequences for both parties, for both stakeholders. I did, oh, by the way, I did employment for about nine years as well as in operations. Well, we thank you very, very much for that uh, valuable perspective. And we have one more lighthearted question here. Okay. Is it true that you actually signed every single dollar bill in your role as US treasurer? Every well, let, let me let me share with you because this question wasn't asked. As U.S. Treasurer, I was responsible for, or let me put it this way: U.S. Treasurers are responsible for um, producing about seven billion um, units of currency and about fourteen billion coins a year. Now, I could never have signed. Uh, 7 billion notes, but they took a sample of my writing and they have a plate and they use that plate to um, to produce my signature and the secretary's sig uh, treasury uh, signature. But I will tell you that the individuals who actually uh, printed the money, the, uh, uh, produced the plate, awarded me that plate in a frame um, when I was a uh, treasurer. So I was really so impressed and so privileged to even receive my signature on the plate that was used to print money. And I promise I'm not gonna use that plate again <laughs> to print any future money. <laughs> wow, 7 billion units of currency, wow. Yeah, that's worth about $356 <laughs> billion, yes. <laughs> well, on behalf of the center, uh, Jovita, thank you for your incredible service to the nation and for sharing so much insight and wisdom uh, from your amazing journey. We are honored by your presence today. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, Mary, of course, we thank you for moderating uh, today's session and making today a special one. And we're just grateful for all that you do every day for the center. Thank uh, so thank you so much to our audience. Hang on, we have a few very quick announcements and I'll ask my team to walk us through those. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reggie, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you enjoyed it, please join us for the next one. We'll be speaking with retired police chief, Mac Tristan, 
about servant leadership in the field of law enforcement. And you can sign up for it right now using that QR code or the link on your screen. And it's not too late to sign up for our next Greenleaf Academy course, Key Practices of Servant Leadership. You can use that QR code or the link on the screen to register. And now we have one last announcement, so I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Priscilla. Thank you, Nick. If you haven't re noticed already, we are re receiving nominations for our first Hall of Fame event that will be taking place this fall. Um, our nominations include individual servant leader exemplars, organizations, and all this information can be found on our website at greenleaf.org. And you'll see on our homepage the button where you can see more information as to the qualifications for these nominations, as well as where to submit these. You can submit nominations to our email, which is info at greenleaf.org. And again, you can find all information regarding the Hall of Fame nominations to Greenleaf Academy and upcoming webinars on our website. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And I would just like to remind them